this is the last session in the first batch certificate course in eco theology next wednesday that means 6th july we have arranged valedictory function i will give the details in the whatsapp group we will be sending you the certificates and a gift from the csi center today's speaker is reverend viji vargi sipan he served as the first director of the ecological department of the csi center and is a presbyter from madhyala diocese he is a good orator a good theologian and he is now studying in, for his doctor studies in ireland so a warm welcome to reverend viji vargi sipan over to reverend viji vargi sipan good evening to each one of you at the very outset may i thank the csi synod the office bearers the department of ecological concerns particularly dr matthew koshi pinaka the academic committee and also the technical assistance team for organizing the certificate course in eco theology before beginning or before welcoming all those who are gathered here dr matthew koshi pinaka announced the sad news of the demise of reverend devan and subhuti i join with each one of you in thanking god for his life and witness and particularly for his friendship with the department of ecological concerns and also for his commitment for uh, uh, to build an eco sensitive community well as we come towards the end of the first batch of the certificate course let us take a moment to look back at the very aim or the very purpose of this course i understand that this course was designed with the aim that the clergy and the lay preachers that they would be facilitated to address the ecological crisis through their pulpit sermons so when we preach eco sensitive or ecological eco theological sermons definitely we need a framework we need tools and for this we were introduced to the earth bible the volumes by normal hebel and those essays that we have read those essays we have heard they offer an invaluable resource for all of us for all preachers and teachers concerned to promote earth keeping practices in local christian communities today as we come to the last class of this certificate course at least of this batch we are going to focus on eco worship and eco liturgy but before proceeding to eco liturgy or eco worship as such i think it is important to ponder about eco theology as a broader framework i am sure that by now we are all familiar about eco theology but i want to cite a few insights from the practical perspective of eco theology so when i speak about eco theology it is about eco praxis it is not just about the theory it's about the practice eco praxis the head of the department of religion and theology in the university of the western cape his name is ernst m conrad according to him eco theology has a twofold critique as a responsibility as a role of a twofold critique and a twofold constructive contribution i repeat a twofold critique and a twofold constructive contribution now what does he mean when he says that it has this responsibility of a twofold critique on the one hand to make an ecological critique of christianity and on the other hand a christian critique of ecological destruction it's same as feminist theology feminist theology on the one hand it makes a feminist critique of christianity the word of god the bible and a theological frameworks on the other hand it attempts a critique a christian critique of patriarchy or maybe similar to black theology a christian critique of racism on the one hand on the other hand a black critique of christianity so the twofold critique responsibility of a twofold critique of eco theology or eco practices to attempt to make an ecological critique of christianity on the one hand and a christian 
critique of ecological destruction. Secondly, he says it has a responsibility of a twofold constructive contribution. And I think for today's session on eco worship and eco liturgy, this is more important. What does he mean when he says a twofold constructive contribution? A constructive contribution to Christian authenticity on the one hand, and on that basis to multidisciplinary discourse on ecological concerns in the public sphere. Or in other words, contribution to the church as well as to the public. Of course, church is a public, I'm aware of that. But for our understanding, just for the sake of us to understand more clearly, I'm using for the church and rest of the public. And contrast, he continues to say that eco-theology has a threefold task, a royal task, a prophetic task, and a priestly task. I'm not going into the details of the royal and the prophetic task, but I want to limit today's session to the priestly task. He says, in order to keep alive what may be called a liturgical vision of the world, we need to sustain the priestly task of ecotheology. Let me repeat, in order to keep alive what may be called a liturgical vision of the world, the priestly task of ecotheology is necessary to be sustained. Let me make it more clear. As we come to the church to worship God, we enter the Christian liturgy, we enter, we enter the Christian liturgy with the burdens of the world on our shoulders as sinners, as sinners, and as sinned against. Now, both these are important. We enter into the space of the time of Christian liturgy, on the one hand, as sinners who have committed sin, and also as sinned against. We are not only sinners, often we are sinned against also, with all our natural theologies, with all our ideologies, idolatries and heresies, we carry all of them into the space and time of Christian liturgy. We bring with us the views and analysis of the world around us and its dominant powers. We come with different perspectives about the earth in which we live. Some of us are very romantic. We come with the perspective, all oh, this earth is so beautiful. And some of us come with our perspective of social Darwinism red in tooth and claw, the social Darwinistic approach to earth. Some of us come with the capitalistic notion of dealing with earth. These natural resources are available for exploitation. Some of us come with the perspective of age of mysticism. Earth as something so sublime that it is to be worshipped. And some of us come with that perspective of eco-modernism. Earth as a threat to be tamed and brought under human control, so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to say is when we enter into the time and space of Christian liturgy, we come as sinners and sinned against with diverse perspectives about the earth, about the creation. And then what happens through the liturgy? Through the liturgy, as we participate in the liturgy, we slowly learn to see the world in a new perspective, in a new light, in the light, L small letter, of the light, L capital letter, of the world. We slowly learn to see the world in a new light, in the light of the light of the world. We begin to see the world around us through God's eyes as God's beloved creation. We realize that this messed up world and the messed up lives in and around us are nevertheless beloved so much so that for God it is even worth dying for. God gave his life not just for me, not just for you, not just for the human beings. But for the whole creation, God found the earth, the whole creation, valuable, so precious and so beloved, so much so that for God, it is even worth dying for. 
See, we are trying to understand or we are trying to see the earth through a new eyes as we enter and participate in the space and time of liturgy. We slowly learn to see the invisible. We get an intuition deeply embedded in the Hebrew, Greek, and African or Asian or European, whatever it is, sensibilities, subaltern sensibilities, earth sensibilities, the contextual sensibilities. We begin to see the earth in the light of heaven in terms of what the world may become and in a hidden way already is. So as ecotheologians, and when I say ecotheologians, I'm not just limiting that to those attending this certificate course. Every person, every person attending, participating in the time and space of liturgy, every person, as we participate in this liturgy, we receive a counterintuitive vision. We came with a vision, but now we are receiving a counterintuitive vision. We exit from the liturgy with God's blessing. When we exit, we are inspired by the vision that a different world, please listen, a different world is not only possible, but has already established even though it remains hidden. It is not just about the otherworldly direction. We are directed to this world. We are directed to this earth today. Now, liturgy challenges and inspires us, redirects us to see this world already established by God. Maybe some of the aspects are given to us. But that does not mean that they do not exist. So we get this counterintuitive vision as we participate in the time and space of liturgy. And we realize there's the liturgy after liturgy. What do we mean when we say liturgy after liturgy? As most of us know, or maybe as all of us know, the word liturgy comes from two Greek words, latos and ergos. Latos is a very familiar word for although it's a Greek word, it's very familiar for us because we are familiar with laity fellowship, latos, the people, lay, laity, people. Ergos, it means work. And I want to tell you and remind you that the word liturgy originally did not originate within the sacred space, within the four walls of the church. Liturgy originally was not a sacred act. It was a secular act. Liturgy actually meant the service that the citizens in the Roman Empire did for their emperor. For the early church, liturgy was a public witness. The Roman emperor said, you can worship only one Lord and that Lord is me, the emperor. The early Christians, the early church said, no, you are not the Lord. There is only one Lord that is Christ. Sometimes in our confirmation classes, we teach creeds. We teach our children there are only two or three creeds. Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, and maybe the Athanasian Creed. But we often forget that the first creed of the church is neither the Apostles' Creed, nor the Nicene Creed, nor the Athanasian Creed, but the first, the first creed of the church, Christian church, is Jesus is Christ. And that was a public witness. The public witness Christians, the early church, they publicly witnessed challenging the empire, challenging the Roman emperor saying, we believe in the one whom you have crucified. He is risen and he lives and we believe in him. He alone is our Lord. So what is liturgy after liturgy? The liturgy that happens in the church, it is just a beginning for us to lift that liturgy as a public witness outside the four walls of the church. And that means the worship, the eco-worship or the eco-liturgy, it should enable you and me to transform the world according to the core identity and characteristics of the triune God. Mercy, justice, peace, 
holistic, inclusive nature of God, we are called to live a liturgy after liturgy, to publicly witness eco-worship and eco-liturgy in the society. Now, before we further discuss about eco-liturgy, I think it is important for us to locate the scope of liturgy in our Christian faith. I tell this because most of us come from a reformed tradition, be it Anglican or Presbyterian or Congregationalist or Methodist, whichever our denominational legacy be. All of us claim that we belong to that reformed tradition. And the reformed tradition, scripture is considered as more important than liturgy. That's why we have pulpit, higher than, elevated than the altar. I'm not going into those details, but in short, scripture is often considered to be more important than liturgy in our church, maybe in line with the reformed tradition. But let me ask you a simple question. What actually was there in the beginning? Was it scripture or prayers? Was it worship or the Bible? I'm sure now your answer would be, Worship was there even before the written word of God. Liturgy was there even before the written word of God. And most of the things that people were worshipping, most of the things that people were using as their prayers, they were borrowed into the written word of God. Those who have underwent theological training for you, the Christological hymn, Philippians 2, is very familiar. That was a hymn in the early church which was taken, absorbed, and added into the written word of God. I'm not trying to say that liturgy is more important than scripture. What I'm trying to say is we have to give importance to scripture as well as liturgy. When we speak about Earth Bible by Norman Hebel, it also means about Earth liturgies. The Earth Bible Project it explores the biblical text from the perspectives of the Earth, suspecting that the text and all its interpreters may be anthropocentric and not geocentric. The same logic should be applied to the liturgies that we use these days. We should see the liturgies with a sense of suspicion. Is this liturgical text or the interpretations of the liturgical text anthropocentric or geocentric? We should ask whether there is a concern for earth community in this liturgical text as in the biblical text or whether earth is being treated unjustly in this biblical text or liturgical text. See, both are important. Biblical text and liturgical text are important. It should attempt to retrieve alternative traditions that hear the voice of the earth and the value of earth more than as a human instrument. I don't want to go back to Norman Hebel and his six guiding ecologist principles just to cite quickly the principle of intrinsic worth the principle of interconnectedness the principle of voice the principle of purpose the principle of mutual custodianship the principle of resistance all these are relevant all these six guiding principles are relevant not just to biblical text but also to liturgical texts therefore this evening, we need to admit that liturgy is as important as the Bible. Liturgy is not to be sidelined. Liturgy is very important or as important as the word of God. The second thing I want to highlight before we proceed to call liturgy is the relationship between liturgy and church. The relationship between the church and liturgy is a two-way relationship. On the one hand, the liturgy of a church, any church for that reason, it reflects the theology of that church. For example, if you want to know the theology of the Catholic Church, all that you need is to visit or to read or to pray the prayers of Catholic Church. If you want to know what Methodist Church believes in, if you want to know what an Orthodox Church or Jacobite Church, Oriental traditions, they believe in, all that you need to do is to go through their liturgies. Now, an example that we will be familiar with is our own liturgy. We know that the Church of South India has revised its liturgy at several stages, and the last revision was in 2006. 
If you look very closely, the 2006 revision of the CSI liturgy, you will see three options for anaphora for the Thanksgiving part, the communion part, it's the second part. Option A, it focuses on the classical interpretation of gospel. The second option, it is more liberational, subaltern. And the third option is creation-centered. Now, what does that mean? So when you pray, when we pray those prayers in the CSI Eucharist liturgy, we realize the theology of the Church of South India. So CSI is the only church, as we know, CSI is the only church where we have creation care incorporated into the constitution, into the preamble. Not only that, CSI is a church which has clearly expressed its theological, ecological motives in their liturgy, very liturgy. I have no time to explain it more clearly, but let us be proud that in the 2006 revision of the CSI Eucharist liturgy, it clearly expresses our ecological commitment and where did the commitment come from? It did not originate or emerge on one day. What happened from 1991 through Dr. Matthew Koshipunekar and many others, they have been urging and urging the church, challenging the church, inspiring the church. And here in 2006, we have it incorporated into the prayers of the Church of South India. And that means the CSI liturgy expresses the ecological commitment of the church. On the other hand, the liturgy of a church shapes the faith of that church. On the one hand, the church is expressing in the liturgy. On the other hand, the liturgy, as we pray, as we sing, as we pray, as we sing, as we pray, as we sing, our faith is shaped and sharpened. The church is being forced and formed as we pray repeatedly, as we pray and sing, as we participate in that liturgy, our faith is being shaped and together they forge the ethics of the believers. For our purpose, for this session, for this class, what is more important is the second part, I would say, that the liturgy shapes us, that liturgy shapes the church. It implies an ecologically sensitive liturgy can edify our belief and shape our lives to live as intentional communities of creation care. Let me repeat, an ecologically sensitive liturgy can edify our belief, it can shape our lives to live as intentional communities of creation care. This calls for liturgies to be transformed so that by praying and singing, those transformed liturgies, we would be transformed. If you follow Marxism, there is this all idea of educating the educator, educating the educator. So liturgy educates us and we are called to educate the liturgy to educate us. Or in other words, to use a very common word that CSI is using these days, there is a demand upon you and me to green our liturgies, green our liturgies, so that those green liturgies would trigger greening us and our congregations. We are dreaming about a green church. And one way that we could accomplish our dream to have a green church is to firstly green our liturgies. Now, with that insight, let us try to understand in detail what does it mean to green our liturgies? Or what does it or, or what do we mean when we say a green liturgy? There are two things that I want to focus on. First thing is there are certain inherent potentials in our existing liturgies to green our congregations. As we know, as I've already mentioned, it is our dream to green our congregations, to have green churches. So firstly, let us try to explore what are certain inherent potentials in our liturgies, in our liturgies to green our congregations. It is an act linked to reclaiming and reinterpreting our liturgies. So when we think about eco-worship and eco-liturgy, the first thing that should come to our mind is about reclaiming the green or green interpretation of the sacraments. 
today because of lack of time i am just going to focus upon the sacraments baptism and eucharist as two sacraments baptism and eucharist are believed to be outward expressions of inward grace or visible sign of the invisible grace am i right baptism and eucharist are sacraments they are believed to be outward expressions of inward grace or visible signs of the invisible grace now what is grace grace is often understood as anthropocentric that is from within a framework of god's salvific plans exclusively for humans how do we explain grace to our confirmation students how do we explain grace to our church members how do we explain grace to our youth members we explain grace exclusively in anthropocentric framework grace exclusively for humans jesus came and died for human beings however we know as we participated from january to this day in this certificate course we know that god's salvific plan is not limited to humans but but it embraces the whole cosmos therefore god's grace is not anthropocentric god's grace is ecocentric so i would say grace is green grace is green or maybe we can say green grace we know a wonderful hymn a very beautiful hymn a celebrated hymn by foliot as fair point the hymn is for the beauty of the earth it was originally written as a eucharistic hymn it seems to paint god's grace in green the hymn paints god's grace in green the hymn is not about god's grace just for human beings it's a green grace that the author the composer of the hymn is is about the first second and last stanzas they transcend the anthropocentric understanding of god's love and justice what does the hymn say it says for the beauty of the earth for the glory of the skies for the love which from our birth over and around us lies lord of all to you we raise this our sacrifice of praise the second stanza for the beauty of each hour of the day and of the night kill and wail and tree and flower sun and moon and stars of light lord of all to you we raise this our sacrifice of praise and the last stanza that is the climax for yourself o oh gift divine to our world so freely give for that love from which will shine peace on earth and joy in heaven lord of all to you we raise this our sacrifice for praise the hymn focuses not just upon the grace that i as a person we as human community received it's a praise a sacrifice of praise is for the beauty of the earth the green grace that embraces the glory of the skies for the beauty of each star of the day and of the night hill and vale and tree and flower sun and moon and stars and light and then it says for yourself for gift divine your gift your grace divine is for all of these the green grace very inclusive holistic green grace some of us might be aware about the wordless book the wordless book it's a book without words the wordless book this wordless book is believed to have been introduced by the famous lenten baptist preacher charles spurgeon in a message given on january 11 1866 to several hundred orphans regarding psalm 517 what is psalm 517 wash me and i shall be whiter than snow the wordless book is used to communicate gospel to children especially through colors such as black red white green and gold it is a visual cue to expound christian doctrine extemporaneously or in impromptu situations one of the critics criticisms against the wordless book its representation through colors is it indirectly endorses racism if the colors are to be rearranged 
I would say praise and salvation can be represented by the color green to underline the cosmic significance of grace. In that sense, the grace we have within each one of us is in continuum with the grace experience around us. That also means the nature around us is a sacrament of God's love. The nature around us is a sacrament of God's love. Sacrament is not just about what we do every Sunday in the church. The very nature around us is a sacrament, a sign of God's love, God's grace, green grace. Now, really looking at baptism and Eucharist as an expression of that green grace compels us to reinterpret those sacraments, particularly the simplest. In baptism, cleansing is symbolized by water. And in Eucharist, fellowship is symbolized by the act of eating and drinking, or more significantly, bread and wine. In baptism, cleansing is symbolized by water. And in Eucharist, fellowship is symbolized by the act of eating and drinking, or more specifically, bread and wine. Water, bread and wine, or maybe water, grain, and grape are connected to ecology. So let us now take a closer look at baptism first and then at Eucharist. The baptismal font is octagonal in shape in many churches. It is octagonal in shape. What does that mean? Have you ever pondered about the meaning of this octagonal shape baptism, baptismal font? The seven sides represent the seven days of creation. And the eighth side represents the new creation in Christ. So in your church, if you see a baptismal form with eight sides, what does that mean? Seven sides, seven days of creation, and the eighth side, new creation. The new creation in the Bible, especially in light of Romans 8.22, where we are informed that the whole creation has been groaning, and in the light of vision of new heaven and new earth, as we see in the book of Revelation, is not merely anthropomorphic instead, it has ecological undertones. Therefore, the baptismal font, whether it is made or carved out of stone or wood, it reminds us about a green grace. Next time when we stand beside the baptismal font and share the homily to the family, remember to interpret the eighth side, new creation, as not anthropomorphic grace, but with ecological undertones about the green grace. Further, baptism as a sacrament takes place next to water or within water. It depends. Like in the funeral liturgy, where there is a prayer to sanctify the grave. Remember, when we do the funeral liturgy, we go to the grave, we sanctify the grave. Like in that funeral liturgy, in the baptismal liturgy, there is a prayer to sanctify the water. This prayer in the baptismal liturgy, which is in the form of an epiclesis, what is epiclesis in the Eucharist liturgy? We have this prayer for the Holy Spirit. So similarly, in the baptismal liturgy, we have this epicletic kind of prayer, praying God to send the Holy Spirit to sanctify the water. It affirms the ontological and patchological ability of water to cleanse and refresh us. This is a clear indication that water during baptism is considered not only for its sacramental value, not only for its symbolic value, but also for its sacred value. It is not that water during any ritual becomes sacred after it is connected to it. Rather, it is connected to the ritual since it is already sacred. Water is sacred. Therefore, it is important not to overlook the sacredness of all waters, not just those drops of water inside the baptismal font. It is important not to overlook the sacredness of all waters, even as we functionally set apart some of the certain ritual, some of the water for certain ritualistic purposes. This indeed also demands us not to profane its sacredness by exploiting or polluting it. So next time when we approach the baptismal form, there is a demand upon you and me, each one of us, whether we lead or whether we partake. There is a demand upon each one of us to consider the sacredness of water, that we do not exploit or pollute water. Having mentioned that baptismal prayers are recited in aquatic settings, in water settings, one should not forget that for as long as humans have prayed, they have probably prayed in water places. This is not just within the Christianity. In other religions also, people go near the water, they dip in themselves into the water and they pray. So aquatic settings, water settings are familiar to almost all religions. 
as Benjamin M. Stewart, who teaches worship at the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago, observes, water often moves us to wonder, joy, terror, or peace, and many times water, whether it is the awesome power of ocean waves, the cold up Filling waters of a spring, a small still pond, the sound of a mountain stream flowing over rocks, deep, slow rivers with creatures rippling the surface, crashing waterfalls, nourishing rain or parched land, the seemingly infinite expanse of the sea or hot springs rising mysteriously from the earth moves us to prayer. According to him, the Christian heritage of praying next to water is older than Christianity itself, being deeply influenced by our Jewish heritage. He cites Psalm 104 in Didache. Didache is actually an early liturgical source of several liturgies. Let us not go into those details, but then he says, he cites Psalm 104 and Didache, one of the major sources of Christian liturgy, to draw connections between the sacramental and ecological significance of water. What is Psalm 104? It's a stunning water prayer, he says. He says it is a stunning water prayer. The psalmist looks out over a water-nourished landscape, teeming with abundant creatures and life, I'm quoting him, and gives thanks to God for blessings that overflow from God to humans and to the whole earth like water streaming down. One might ask after reading this psalm, what is flowing down from the mountains and the skies with such powerful blessings? What is it that is giving life to the diverse creatures named in the psalm? Is it water? Is it God? The beautiful answer is, of course, both. Both God and water simultaneously. On the one hand, it speaks about God acting like nourishing water flowing through our world. And on the other hand, it refers to the actual water that flows, nourishing our lands and all creatures. Coming to Didache, Benjamin says, concerning baptism, concerning baptism in Didache, it is said, baptize in this way. After speaking all these words, baptize into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in living water. If you do not have living water, baptize in other water. If you are not able in cold water, in warm. If you do not have either, pour water on the head three times into the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So this Didache lists water that is flowing from a living source. Living in this context means naturally flowing like a river or stream. And it seems that Didache assumes that the baptized are plunged into this water three times. Therefore, as Christians are made in baptismal waters, all of these associations, the overflowing blessings of God, the nourishing flow of water over the landscape, the always new quality of flowing water, and life being power that flows to us from beyond the control should inspire us to be committed to preserving waters as sanctified bodies. To preserve waters as sanctified bodies. It calls not only for a sacramental communion with water, but an organic communion. Not just a sacramental, symbolic communion, but an organic communion that challenges us to live as a new creation. As the eighth side of the octagonal form signifies, politically committed to engage in sanctifying water in particular and nature in general. We should reclaim the potential of our existing baptismal liturgies to forge eco-sensitive congregations. In other words, it calls for a lived liturgy, lived eco-liturgy. Often, we engage in debates related to the doctrine of baptism about the age, about the form, about the formula, etc. We are more concerned about I was baptized than I am baptized. We are more concerned about I was baptized than I am baptized. I am baptized refers not to the event of baptism, but the experience, the continuing life as a baptized member. It is about a commitment as the new creation to die and rise in Christ, to say no to sin and Satan, but to Christ is our call. That demands us to live an alternative life, resisting all structures and forces of evil that pollute and market nature, ecology, environment, including water. Therefore, even without changing a word of our existing baptismal liturgy, it is possible to challenge our congregations to be eco-congregations by reclaiming the green in the baptismal liturgy. We can include in this theme of green commitment, maybe not in the essentials, but accessories. Since this session is also about greening the liturgies, 
Let me add, we can include this perspective in our exhortations during baptisms. Now, having mentioned about baptism, let us now quickly visit Eucharist. Coming to the Eucharist, the first things that come to our mind when we think about the sacrament are bread and wine. Jesus, while instituting the sacrament, took the bread and wine and identified himself with them. The words of institution in the Anaphora says, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The words of administration are, this is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Again, our debates, like in the baptismal liturgies, are often centered around the doctrines regarding the change of substance, that is transubstantiation or memorial or consubstantiation and within consubstantiation about consecrationism, receptionism, many doctrines. And we conveniently forget about the change that should happen within us. Whether we follow transubstantiation, that is bread as body and wine as blood or memorial, that is bread and wine, whatever it is, the point is, is this not the communion of the body of Christ? And is this not a communion of the blood of Christ? We are constantly reminded that Jesus used bread and wine products from nature to represent his suffering. Is, is this not the communion of the body of Christ? Is this not a communion of the blood of Christ? We are constantly reminded that Jesus used bread and wine products from nature to represent his suffering. Now that invites an attraction to the land from which the grain and grape were produced and those who labored, produced, who processed them into bread and wine. In fact, the act of giving thanks during a Jewish meal, particularly the Passover meal, included a prayer called Berkat Hamazon. It had four blessings. The first one for food, the second one for the land. It's all like we have mentioned regarding the baptismal liturgy, the Eucharist liturgy should inspire us not debate about the change in substance, but to dialogue about our own change or transformation. And this dialoguing should happen in solidarity with the earth communities, Dalits, tribals, Adivasis, and Fisher people. Only then, what we pray in our post communion prayer, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of thy son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, will become meaningful. Let me cite the anamnesis from option B in 2006, revised Eucharist liturgy of the CSI. It says, as the bread is broken and this wine poured out, O seeker and savior of the lost, we remember again the poor and oppressed of the earth. See how beautiful is CSI liturgy, how theological, how ecological, how sensitive, how socially concerned with justice is our liturgy. It says, as this bread is broken and this wine poured out, O seeker and savior of the lost, we remember again the poor and oppressed of the earth. We recall that your body was broken, that the hungry might be nourished, the oppressed set free, replenished with the bread of new hope and new life. Therefore, till now what I have been saying is, let us not disregard our liturgy. There are already inherent potentials within our liturgies to be reclaimed and reinterpreted to foster, to build an eco-green congregation. But then it is also for us to, it's also important for us to critique our liturgies because our liturgies are mostly based on Greek dualism, which through Paul, through Augustine, through Aquinas, through the Anglicans, the Reformation, it came through Calvin to our church. It is already there, human versus nature, holy versus unholy. There is a kind of hierarchy, the pyramid, the clergy, laity, and then the gender, caste, race, earth, subordinated position. No, we need to critique this kind of hierarchy in our liturgy. I have several more things to be shared, but I'm just skipping a few thoughts. Maybe we can discuss these things later. As I come to the last part of this presentation, I want to give you two thoughts. One is a methodology to make eco-liturgies. I borrow the insight from Claudio Chavales, a Brazilian theologian. He's a liberation theologian and a liturgist. He divides the whole methodology into four subheadings: context, question, solution, method. 
It's very simple. It's very simple. Context, question, solution, method. Context, most of us, we are placed ourselves above any other form of life. We're extracting more from the earth than it can offer. We are straining natural resources beyond the earth's sustainable supply and we know the context of ecological injustice. The question is, what prayers are Christians called to pray during these times? How are we to pray as we are confronted by a world in collapse? And he says the solution. The condition of our world begs for different prayers and different forms of prayer. As we witness the pain of the poor, the collapsing of the world we know, and the natural disasters around the globe, there seems to be no prayer that can respond to it at all. However, we must pray anyway. And the way we pray makes total difference. Such prayers will be anathema to any form of government that sustains war, that oppresses people, animals, mountains, oceans, and the whole earth. And he ends with his methodology. Where should our prayers come from? This is very important. Where should our prayers come from? Our prayers should come from places of collapse and the debris of horrors. The prayer should engage with earth and the people. The prayer should speak of the trauma poor people face every day. Our prayer should have ears attached to the earth, our ears attached to the earth and eyes upon those who suffer and hands stretched out in solidarity with both. In simple words, one needs to decolonize our liturgies. In fact, there are studies which consider liturgical movement, especially as an act of decolonizing. But then it's very important for us to sustain the spirit of decolonizing liturgies. Most of our prayers continue to be Eurocentric. Most of our prayers continue to be Eurocentric, the dominant liturgies. That is not connected to the subaltern context in Asia, Africa, Latin America, or elsewhere. One example of decolonial liturgy is the Lord's Prayer itself. Jesus decolonized the Lord's Prayer. You had a session on that, so I will not go into that. But Jesus decolonized the whole aspect of 18 benedictions as it was prayed during his time. And he reinterpreted 18 benedictions into Lord's Prayer. That is an absolute example of decolonizing the liturgy. I have no time to explain those details, but remember the Lord's Prayer itself is an absolute example of a decolonized liturgy. Now, as I end, let me give some eco-liturgical signposts. What can we do in our church context? We can green the pulpit through green enactments, embraced by this thought of green grace and green salvation. Can we preach from our pulpits about green grace and green salvation? When we speak about Christology, that does not limit to the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is also about the birth, the life, the death, and resurrection of earth and earth communities in whom we see Christ, in whom Christ manifests. Easter, when we celebrate Easter, it is actually about compost from waste and life from compost. Isn't it? Can we reinterpret Easter as composed from waste and life from compost? How do we understand offertory? Offertory is about private versus communion, accumulation versus serving, sharing. When we offer ourselves, when we offer our body and mind, we're also offering our needs for common flourishing. Eco justice is about common flourishing. We celebrated Environment Sunday, but can we think about an ecological Shabbat starting from Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Not just for two hours, not just for half a day, but encouraging, inspiring our church members to practice an ecological Shabbat during that weekend. Shabbat in all its meaning. Again, no time to explain, but can we think about an ecological Shabbat going beyond one environmental Sunday? When we use imageries, can we think about organic images? For example, when we think about God's power of transformation, can we think about light becoming chlorophyll, what waste becoming combust, exchange of carbon dioxide for oxygen? Remember, God is the original recycler. God is the original recycler. God is the original recycler. I know that in many churches, we are planting and naming trees for special occasions. But we also should think about green lectionaries and green collects during the season of creation. Or maybe some Sundays can we observe as Forest Sunday, Land Sunday, Wilderness Sunday, River Sunday, Earth Sunday, Humanity Sunday, Sky Sunday, Mountain Sunday, Ocean Sunday, Founder Sunday, Storm Sunday, Cosmos Sunday. 
How do we understand septuagesima, sexagesima, and quinquagesima associated with Lent? Can we think it from a holistic ecological perspective? CSI is one church that advocated Carmen Lent. Thank God. Can we green the feast like Feast of Trinity? Raymond Dos Panica speaks about cosmos, theandric. Trinity is not just about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Cosmos, theos, and humans. Earth, God, and humans. That Trinity. How do we understand Feast of Epiphany? Can we green our Feast of Trinity, Feast of Epiphany? Can we think about green liturgies, lament and doxology in the reading, enhancing ecological consciousness through liturgical acts of doxology and lament? CSI already have got many green resources, green Bible studies. Can we think about pan entheistic prayers and litanies? Can we combine eco-political and eco-liturgical acts? Do we have the courage to conduct baptism in an exploited river? Let me ask you, do we have that courage to conduct baptism in an exploited river, conducting Eucharist in a field against landfilling, conducting Eucharist in a field against landfilling, or conducting Eucharist with the farmers engaging in farmers' protests? They are still fighting some places. Can we engage? And can we? I think we should liberate harvest festivals from its economic bondage, I would say and celebrate it as an earth festival. Can we think about eco-friendly architecture, simple and humble architecture, where we could have more air and light. We preach about ecology, and when we build churches, we build churches of crowds and cross, and we get sand from those unlicensed people to make economic gains. Where is the ecological commitment? When we build churches of huge money and buying sand and other raw materials from people who exploit the earth. That's why I said we need to combine eco-political and eco-liturgical acts. I conclude. Recently I read a book on disability and I posted that on Facebook. It's The title of the book is My Body is Not a Prayer Request. And Amy Kenny, the author, says this book is a scream. This is book is not a prayer request. This is a scream. On its pages, you might find parts of my story that make you feel uncomfortable, confused, or even convicted. I hope that you continue reading, knowing that these moments of discomfort are points of departure rather than destinations. My screams are called to action. As you listen to my screams, may they call you to join me in reimagining the church together. May they reverberate until no disabled person ever has to stifle their screams again. Let me borrow those words and conclude. Ecology is not a mere prayer request. Ecology is not a mere prayer request. Ecology is about screams. It's about groanings that make us feel uncomfortable. Groanings that make us feel confused and even convicted. And those moments of discomfort are points of departure rather than destinations. Groanings are a call to action. As we listen to those groaning through the worship, may, they, may those groanings, those screams call us to join the earth in reimagining the church together. The time allotted to me is still 9.30, so I finish here. Thanks for the opportunity. I think we will have time for discussion, question, and answers, and you can add to what I have said. You can register your dissent to what I have said, and we have time for that. Thank you.